Ait Skoyal. My name is Lisa Cook. My father was Rusty Wilson, and my grandmother was Sarah James from Lummi, and my grandfather was Charles Wilson from Cape Mudge. I grew up fishing during the Bolt era. Fishing has been a big part of my life. I grew up gill netting with my dad on skiffs. We fished up at Point Roberts, the Salmon Banks, and all the way down to Hood's Canal. I remember the last time we fished for herring just off the dock from Cherry Point. We made quite a bit of money back then. It provided me with my school clothes every year. And I know that fishing is a part of who I am today. In 2013, the creator directed me to the Northwest Indian College. I found out about the Native Environmental Science Program. Finding my way to the Northwest Indian College has been one of the best things that I have ever done in my life. In one of my classes, we read Where the Salmon Run, The Life and Legacy of Billy Frank Jr., and I watched As Long as the River Runs and Back to the River. I loved learning about this. I kept having a little voice in the back of my mind that kept asking myself, where is all of our information? It made me want to learn more about our Lummi history. I definitely felt the need to research our history and compile a documentary of the fishing history of the Lummi people for my capstone project. I wanted to do this so that our people will know the history and the sacrifices that our ancestors made in order to give us what we have today. I know that it is very important that we pass this down to our future generations and it will be my legacy that I leave behind. The Lummi were very advanced. They knew the land and the environment. There was a connection established between the resources on the land that helped them catch the resources from the sea. In turn, they utilized every piece of the catch to make sure that nothing went to waste. It was a time that all life was honored and not taken for granted. The culture included a great level of technology for all aspects of fishing and marine transportations. Heavy and coarse nets were made from the fibers of cedar, which was found in large groves. Finer nets, such as gill nets and herring nets, were made from nettle fibers. They were adept constructing numerous kinds of weirs, traps, dip nets, beach sands, and spears with harpoons for various fish. The most significant fishing technology developed by the Lummi was the invention of the reef net. This was one of the most successful and genius forms of fishing developed by man in this region. After European contact and throughout colonization, many tribes signed treaties with the United States. The Lummies paddled down to Muckleteo to sign the Point Elliot Treaty with Isaac Stevens. Stevens had a mandate. He negotiated treaties in order to obtain as much land as possible. The treaty signing was negotiated in the Chinook jargon language, a deceitful way of communicating. Salmon have always been sacred to the Lummi people. They made sure that there were provisions made in the treaty to protect their Shalangan way of life. The Lummies were well represented at the signing of the treaty. At least a dozen chiefs and headmen attended the proceedings and signed the treaty. It was perhaps due to the size of the delegation that the Lummies secured a reservation in the heart of their ancestral lands on the island of Chachusen, where the Nooksack River splits and sends two branches into the inland waters at Lummi Bay and Bellingham Bay. The majority of the land was ceded to the United States government in exchange for the tribe's right to continue to fish and hunt in their usual and accustomed territories. After the signing of the treaty, the Lummies were reduced to 12,500 acres of land. As long as the rivers run, as long as the tide flows, as long as the sun shines, you will have land, fish, and game for your frying pans, and timber for your lodges. At the time of the signing of the treaty, salmon was not of significant importance to the settlers because they had limited ways of preserving the fish. The only way that they were able to store them was to cure them with salt and barrel them, so they depended on the lummies to provide their salmon to them. It was not until the invention of canning that the European Americans saw real value in the salmon. Lummy fishing grounds were gradually taken over when salmon fishing became commercialized in western Washington. The settlers were already exploiting resources with the potential to produce a surplus for market. They became skilled processors. They were ready to harvest the most abundant salmon runs, which included the Fraser River sockeye. However, as the industry developed, the lummies were pushed aside. The Bureau of Indian Affairs insisted that the lummies pursue agriculture. This was another tactic used to separate the Lummies from the salmon industry. As diligently as the BIA tried, the Lummies were not farmers. 
They were fishermen. A letter written by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs stated, The Indians, as a rule, are not systematic farmers. Farming is with them the incident and not the business of everyday life. Some of them, the more thrifty and industrious, have well-cultivated farms and comfortable houses, and are anxious to have their children educated. They generally live like white people. Those, however, are the exception. A large majority spend most of their time in their canoes, fishing, especially during the salmon season. The Lummies were pushed out of the fishery 45 years after their fishing rights were insured through the signing of the treaty. Point Roberts was a major traditional fishing area for the Lummy, but that soon changed with fish traps that were erected by Alaska Packers Fish Company. The traps were set directly in front of the Lummy's reef net fishing site, obstructing all the fish from entering the reef net. The Lummies knew this was a violation of their treaty rights. In 1894, they petitioned for the Commissioner of Indian Affairs for help. They wrote a letter stating the problem of the obstruction of their reef net site. Fifty-two Lummy members signed the petition. Sadly, not only was nothing done to rectify the situation, but two more fish traps were set up in front of their sites at Village Point, and all temporary fishing shacks for curing the fish were torn down, which was also a violation of the treaty. In 1897, the first court case, United States, Hilaire Crockett, Captain Jack versus Alaska Packers, Kate Waller, was overseen by the Honorable Judge Hanford. Judge Hanford dismissed the case claiming that the fish were abundant and the traps did not interfere with the reef nets and it would be in the best interest of the Lummy because they relied on the employment from the cannery. Even though the Alaska Packers case came before the Winans case, it did not get the same recognition. The U.S. v. Winans, 1905, the court ruled that treaty Indians had reserved the right to cross non-Indian lands to fish at usual and accustomed places, and that treaties were to be interpreted the way the Indians had understood them. The case brought about the reversal of Judge Hanford's decision regarding the Alaska Packers case eight years earlier. The judgment, however, did not stop the state from arresting Lummi fishermen. In 1906, Francis Celestine was arrested for fishing without a state license at a point directly offshore of the reservation. The next challenge that the Lummi faced was by State Fish Commissioner L.H. Darwin, who arrested Lummi fisherman Dan Ross for fishing without a license, but it was ruled that Indians did not require a fishing license. In spite of this decision, Darwin continued arresting Lummi fishermen. Some of the Lummi fishermen that were arrested were Dan Ross, John Alexis, George Boone, Frederick Pearson, Michael Quina, Julius Charles, Peter Victor, Matt Paul, John Horn, Peter Quina, Harry Swalton, and William James. The Lummi filed an injunction suit against Darwin. This case came to be known as Dan Ross v. Darwin. The next case was John Alexis, a Lummi man arrested for fishing without a fishing license and for fishing during the closed season. This was important because the Lummies and their attorneys took this to the state Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the state Supreme Court ruled against Alexis. The Lummies and attorneys thought that this would be a great case to try with the U.S. Supreme Court because it abrogated treaty rights. Regrettably, it never happened because of a similar court case back east that was less favorable for fishing rights, even though they were two very different cases. Another issue was confusion over boundaries and low watermark lines of the reservation. Non-Indian fishermen came onto the reservation claiming they had a right to fish, but the Lummi disagreed with this. In 1916, an Austrian fishing boat set a purse net in Hales Pass. Shortly afterward, Lummi fishers seized the net. Fish Commissioner Darwin persuaded the prosecuting attorney to arrest the Lummi fishers. The Lummies insisted that they were right and warned the Austrians that they would arrest them if they came back onto the reservation. They stayed true to their word and arrested 14 Austrians shortly afterward. They were going to prosecute, but the Attorney General did not want to cause hard feelings between the fishermen. And also, Darwin agreed to back down on exercising jurisdiction over Tidelands. Between the turn of the century and the mid-1930s, the Lummies were almost totally omitted from the commercial salmon fishing industry. In 1934, the BIA had refused to allow the Lummi to reef net, claiming that it was a part of the fish traps that had been outlawed. The rule was soon changed, but the non-Indian fishermen took over the sites and started their own reef netters association. 
leaving the Lummies without their traditional fishery. In 1942, the Thule case finally established that Indians did not require a state license to fish. The Supreme Court decided in Thule v. Washington, 1942, that because a treaty takes precedence over state law, Indians with tribal treaty rights could not be required to buy state fishing licenses. However, the court also ruled that the state could regulate treaty fisheries for purposes of conservation. Fourteen Yakima tribal members filed suit against Oregon's regulation of off-reservation fishing in the case of So Happy v. Smith, 1968. The U.S. and the Yakima, Warm Springs, Umatilla, and Nez Perce tribes also sued to enforce Indian off-reservation fishing rights, U.S. v. Oregon, 1969. The federal court combined the two cases, Judge Bellany in So Happy v. Smith, U.S. v. Oregon, 1969, the Bellany decision, ruled that the four treaty tribes were entitled to a fair share of the fish runs and the state was limited in its power to regulate treaty Indian fisheries. The state could only regulate when reasonable and necessary for conservation. Further state conservation regulations could not discriminate against the tribes using the least restrictive means necessary. In the late 1960s, the Lummies were approached by a corporation that wanted to build a magnesium oxide plant on Lummy Bay. People were concerned that the pollution from the process of reducing ore to metal would ruin the fishing grounds of Whatcom County. At the same time, the Lummies were approached by Dr. Wally Heath, who was an instructor at Western Washington University. Wally had a background in aquaculture from the Pacific Islands and wanted to pursue the opportunity of creating a sea pond at Lummy. Sam Keggy, the Lummi chairman at the time, helped in implementing this idea. The idea was so innovative that they appeared on the Dick Cavett Show. Director for the Lummi tribe, and Sam Keggy, over here, who is councilman of the Lummies. Uh, the situation in a lot of Indian... The crux of this is that Indian land is being threatened all over the U.S. Um, outside industries try to come in and set up shop on reservations. Uh, they would uh, pollute the air and water, always, it seems, uh, to say nothing of wrecking the land. And strip mining is one of the greatest of these threats. The Lummies have uh, somehow avoided this fate, although it almost happened to them. The Northern Cheyennes and the Paiutes are threatened with it right now. And uh, we have a film which spells this out. Pretty clearly, we'll get into that shortly. Uh, let me ask Sam first, how did the Lummies uh, manage to avoid this disaster? Uh, I think uh, just the fact that uh, the industries that wanted to come in, uh, take uh, mining, uh, not so much coal, but uh, magnesium oxide, yeah. and the promises that uh, they would uh, all be a sort of a heaven-sent savior Mm -hmm. to the Lummi people. Uh, with a little research, we found out there were a polluting industry, and their byproducts were not at all usable uh, yeah. in any way, shape, or form. And uh, I think what the Lummi people were looking for when uh, we started was something that would be compatible to our own culture. And we found this in the fish farming idea that sprung up uh, out of nowhere and developed to what we have today. It's an incredible thing. I don't know how many know the word aquaculture, but uh, what the Lummies do now is farm the sea, in effect. Uh, they build a sensational dike that uh, one engineer told them would not work, and you, at the very lowest tide, manage to build this thing and uh, have a, a booming business going in, in farming the sea, the way the ancient Hawaiians used to do, uh, I guess. And we have a film that shows uh, this project that you're talking about. Can, we, can you tell us about that? Do we roll that and... Uh, Dr. K D Dr. Um, Heath, right? Will you tell us uh, what we're going to look for in the film, what we're going to see? We narrate it as we roll it. I think the uh, theme really is that this was probably the first time in American history that uh, government agencies, namely Office of Economic Opportunity and Economic Development Administration, gave money directly to a tribe in large amounts on the order of $2 million, really sticking their necks out. And a few key administrators, like Secretary Podesta and uh, Jim Wilson and OEO, yeah. um, allowed the tribe to build a very expensive dike with a lot of risk and said, okay, sink or swim. And they swam very well. 
The uh, Lummi Indians have, are one of the many Northwest tribes whose culture has been close to the sea. They're expert fishermen, but now they're growing fish. Here you see seed oysters under a microscope. They have the first uh, oyster hatchery in the Northwest. They prepare seed for sale, as you see here, or they grow it themselves uh, uh, in a tray, a uh, very much more modern way of doing it. This is the Lummi Indian oyster hatchery. It's built on the Indian longhouse design using Indian culture. Uh, modifications to let the light in through plastic uh, surfaces. The uh, assistant director of this is a Lummi who started out as a carpenter and is now one of the experts in this field. From the air you see the beginning of the dike which the Lummi's built themselves. They ended up purchasing about 10 trucks in the process. Built three miles of dike uh, between the tides, a very difficult and risky thing to do. But as a result of this enterprise, they branched out into other things, such as uh, home building. They built 40 houses on their own in six months, first class, and they're now going to build 60 more, eventually 400 homes. Here is the sea pond, 700 acres, a three-mile dike, and you can see the plankton bloom inside, which is the uh, food for the oysters. Incredible. Which gives you some idea. Uh, there is no other sea farm of this kind, and uh, there are about <coughs> 75 jobs uh, 90% uh, of the workforce is Indian, and eventually it will be 100% Indian. In U.S. versus Washington, 1974, the Bolt decision, Judge Bolt mandated that a fair share meant 50% of the harvestable fish destined to pass the tribe's usual and accustomed fishing places and reaffirmed tribal management powers. A significant point that played a key role in the Bolt decision was the use of the language from the Point Elliot Treaty in 1855. One pivotal phrase was, usual and accustomed fishing grounds. This phrase was taken from Article 5 of the treaty. The area that it refers to is on and off reservation areas where Indians usually fished and were accustomed to fishing there since time immemorial, before the white man came. This was important because it was an acknowledgement that Indians fished in other places besides the reservation. To fish in common with meant sharing equally in the Indian treaties, and this decision in common with meant sharing equally the opportunity to take fish at usual and accustomed grounds and stations. Therefore, treaty fishermen shall have the opportunity to take up to 50% of the harvestable salmon catch. The Supreme Court upheld U.S. v. Washington in 1979. Lummi had many heroes that devoted their lives to protecting treaty rights. Florence and Forrest Dutch Kenley were two tribal members that were influential in the Judge Bolt decision. Their most enduring contributions and accomplishments on behalf of Lummi people were their roles in presenting the legal case and issues of United States v. Washington leading to the Bolt decision. In 1973, testimony depositions of Forrest Kenley were identified as farmer and fisherman. It was a case of new and old documents, of past and present, and of changing times. Not many know that the oldest voices of the Lummi were witnesses before Judge Bolt. More than 25 affidavits from Lummi fishermen, chiefs, and leaders from the 1895 case of United States versus Alaska Fish Packing Company were introduced as evidence and exhibits for the Bolt case. From Point Roberts to the San Juans, from reef netting and purseining to the old fish traps and wheels, a century's history of Lummi River, shore, and marine fish harvesting and management, including new strides in aquaculture, was placed in evidence before Judge Bolt. Florence and Dutch were also instrumental in the development of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Florence was the first secretary for the Fisheries Commission. In 1962, Dutch was elected chairman of the Interim Commission. Dutch also served as its first official chairman for the first three years. Our backbone is our salmon. As he always says, it's the most important thing as the air that we breathe. If it wasn't for the fish, there would be no lummy people.
We are the sons of Squally, the snap to the salal of Lachas Kino Hicks, the Oxal of Sihonamak. So you do squall at the Nestraja, Chaheno could be a squall at the salal of Lacha Treaty. Just giving you a few words in the language to kind of inspire you as to who you are and where you come from. Don't forget who you are and where you come from. The research that I have conducted has not only made an impact on my capstone, but it has also touched me personally. I set out to answer my question of who and Lummi were our Billy Frank Juniors. I now know who in our tribe fought for our fishing rights and sacrificed themselves by going to jail and writing letters and signing petitions and learning how the court systems worked in order to obtain legal assistance in the fight to uphold our treaty rights. This for me has been a very healing journey and has inspired me to continue with my work in preserving our history for our future generations. I was very humbled and overwhelmed when I came across my grandmother's transcript and hearing her voice for the first time in more than 35 years was very emotional for me. This is another sign in my research that proves to me that I am on the right path and I am doing the work that is vital to protect our way of life. This work is not only academic, it has been a soul searching adventure as well. I cannot stress enough how important that this work is to me. I know that I am exactly where the Creator has guided me to be and I know that it will be my legacy that I leave behind. You see, the Indians fished. They caught fish for their eat. That's why they had to live by the river. Mm -hmm. I wish to dedicate this work to my father, Reginald Rusty Wilson, who taught me how to fish when I was five years old and instilled in me a great work ethic. He taught me how to be a strong native woman and educated me on the importance of salmon to our people and the significance of the Judge Bolt decision. I know I am the person that I am today because of his teachings of treating people with love and respect and the importance of family. To him, I will be forever grateful. Dad, I love you more than a million sockeye. <laughs>